Welcome back to Echo Ridge, where we are continuing to build a colony inside of a shoebox. Today's episode, we're going to be doing an industrial brick makeover, along with trying to figure out plans for this space here. We're also going to be sending Ed and the dumpster rocket back to space to continue gathering those data banks. In fact, we are filling the rocket, although it is going a little bit slower than normal. Mostly because, well, we're sort of running out of steam. So I think it might be time to switch over to the petroleum engine, which of course means that we're gonna need an oxidizer, which means we need to build the space for our oxalite refinery, and that way we can continue doing all the space research missions and even throw a cargo bay on it to boot. And that'll take us all the way into cryofuel combustion, where we can start getting our hydrogen engine and our liquid oxidizer tank. So eventually we're also going to be building a liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen setup, but I think I might be able to squeeze that somewhere in here, or maybe even here. By that time, hopefully we will not be needing this big old water tank. In fact, we might be reducing it sooner rather than later because we could use this space. So long story short, we have lots to do today. But well, we're going to go ahead and start off by showing you a particularly weird bug. Take note that there is a layer of water sitting here. There's no water in the tanks because all those tanks are being filled directly from this polluted water vent and this liquid pump. We're not dropping any of the water down here. So I'm not exactly sure where this water is coming from. But as an example, we'll go ahead and mop it up. I start here. That way we can get this tile here. And then I extend it all the way over. And then once they finish mopping all this up, I'm going to leave the camera sitting here. So you can see the odd effect that's happening. Take note that there is no water currently in this tank. And now there is. Did you see the bubble? What I think is happening is the steam is somehow transferring through here, traveling up to the top, and then condensing into water. I'm not exactly sure how it's happening, but that's the best theory I have. In order to fix it, we're just going to throw a layer of insulated tiles down. We don't need this abyssalite here anymore anyways. And it's not just this corner piece here because every once in a while it's also happening here. It might be flashing on the abyss light, but why only two tiles? And why is it so inconsistent? And why did it just start doing it now? That polluted water has been sitting on that abyss light for 440 cycles. With our layer of insulated tile in, now we actually have to go through the process of moving all these liquid reservoirs down. Because somewhere in the weird Ani laws of physics, tanks that are not sitting on tiles can no longer transfer liquid through pipes. Not a big deal, just a little time consuming. There we go, just like new. And so far, we have not had any of the mysterious water appearing. We also have the rocket fully fueled. Unfortunately, we're in one of those forever meteor storms. But just as soon as it lets up, we're going to send Ed off. And then we're going to do an upgrade to the rocket shaft. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that was the only bug that's happening, but our dupes are still getting scalded. I've gone over this base with a fine tooth comb, trying to figure out why. And so far, I have been very unsuccessful. I even went to the measure of rerouting the carbon dioxide that we were feeding directly to the skimmer. Instead, it now goes directly into the rocket shaft, crosses, and then gets dumped to the vacuum of space. But we're still getting scalded. Even here in the bathroom, there is no more hot debris, quite frankly, because we just stopped picking it up. There's no random hot gases either. So if you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments below. Because hearing a scalding message every few minutes is turning out to be more than just an annoyance. Ed and their rocket are now gone, and we've also been working on the upgrade to the rocket silo. In an attempt to limit how much damage meteors will do to the insulated tile whenever they randomly come through the open bunker door, we're lining the silo with bunker tiles. Unfortunately, we can't do this everywhere. You'll notice this bunker tile is sitting at around 170 degrees. This one here is at 275. In other words, they're just going to keep getting hotter and hotter. If I were to put it over on this side without having it wrapped in insulated tile, it would superheat everything in here. Oh, I suppose I got to let Carol back over. And I think that would just cause more problems than it's worth. And I can't actually wrap it in the insulated tile because, well, there's not enough room for both an insulated tile and bunker tiles. At least not with this current setup. We've also gone ahead and sealed this whole bottom area. Now, I'm trying to figure out the best way to get down here and start doing work. But so far, all of my ideas sort of lead to just opening up the industrial brick and letting the industrial brick handle the heat. But I think that idea is a little bit too echo-like and foolhardy at the same time. There's a lot of material down here, and it's all sitting at above 700 degrees. You know what? If the debris is the problem, 
let's just move all the debris. Doing it manually would probably take just a bit too long, and inevitably create a lot of scaldings throughout our colony. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put auto supers down. For instance, on the first auto super, it's gonna be positioned here, and it'll pick everything up and put it into this automatic dispenser. This auto super is gonna take everything that drops out of that automatic dispenser and dump it to the next automatic dispenser. And it's gonna continue to do that all the way down until all the debris is stacked right here. Literally an automated bucket brigade. Unfortunately, it is too warm in here for auto sweepers. So as soon as we're done building them, we're gonna disable auto repair and that way we don't blow all of our steel reserves. But that also means we're gonna have to deconstruct them and rebuild them quite often. It's a little bit more manual than we'd like, but at least we're gonna get all the debris out of here. We're also gonna make sure we power all the automatic dispensers because while I'm not 100% sure, I believe they empty a little bit quicker when they're powered. Elsewhere on the colony, we have finished the upgrade, at least to the left side, of the rocket silo. It looks pretty cool too. I wish there was enough room to do both sides, and I suppose if I were to redesign this whole area, we could probably squish it in by one more tile. But once again, I don't think that juice is worth the squeeze. You know what though? We do have another oil reservoir. We could move this whole thing and attach it to our new industrial brick. There is a surprising amount of options for such a tiny, tiny base. While well, the bucket brigade's working, that's good news. Unfortunately, the auto sweepers don't last very long until they need to be rebuilt. So I think we're just going to leave it on auto repair for just a little while. Also, as a note, I made all the sweep commands a priority one. That way the dupes have less of a chance of coming down here, grabbing this stuff and putting it somewhere else. Let's keep track and see how much steel this is going to cost us. Right now, we're sitting at five tons. Look at that. Clean as a baby's bottom. Now we can do the stupid echo idea. We'll start by insulating this back in, putting another couple bunker tiles here just for consistency. Of course, I suppose a meteor could come in at just the exact shallow angle, and that would be bad potatoes. I suppose before we just drop the bottom out of the industrial brick, we probably should come up with a plan on how the new brick's gonna look. A couple of the goals, I'd really like to utilize this oil reservoir. I'd also like to make it as compact as possible because while we do have a little bit more space, we know we're gonna fill that in pretty quickly. And then lastly, I'd like to make it an official power plant. That way we could use the power control station. All of course made possible because we have an infinite supply of metals. I'd also like to move these steam turbines. I have a feeling it's the steam turbines that are causing the scaldings. Even though the water that they're outputting is in insulated pipes, I have a feeling it has something to do with the point in time when the steam turbine takes the steam and turns it into water. I know I'm reaching for straws here, but quite frankly, it's all I got. Another problem I realized we're gonna have is if we're still running slicksters, the stable is going to interfere with the power plant because the two room types will end up being in conflict. Well, there's one way to solve that problem. Just get rid of the slicksters. We don't really need the food. I mean, we're running all these bristle blossoms. We have all the pips up here. Of course, we don't really need pips either. But either way, between the omelets and the gristleberries, we have plenty of food. And now that I'm thinking about it, with us getting rid of the stable and everything that it takes, and being able to extend the layer here, the makeover might not be as massive as we were thinking. Another bonus is now that we're not going to have petroleum falling in here, we can get rid of this weird system too. Let's go ahead and open this up and see what kind of trouble we can get into. Ooh, look at the pretty colors! Yeah, there was a lot of carbon dioxide compressed in this little area. I should have expected that one. Not a big deal. We've made some progress. We now have a beautiful power plant, and that's going to allow us to add Engie's tune-up to all of our generators in here, increasing their output by 50%. We had to move the gas pump over, change where this ladder rung is, and then add the door. But so far, I think it might even look cleaner. Now with having all this space and way too much carbon dioxide in here, I kind of feel bad for eradicating the slicksters. What's worse is I can't bring them back because now they're all delicious barbecue and fluffy omelets. There is something absolutely ridiculous about 3,000 watt petroleum generators. Not to mention 1,200 watt hydrogen generators. Oh, NG's tune-up, you are amazing. So apparently my bunker doors were not closing fast enough when Ed and the dumpster rocket returned. And so we got quite a bit of damage. I was disappointed to see that the bunker tiles work the same way as the bunker doors. In other words, when a meteor hits here, it still damages the insulated tile. Now all the bunker tiles are doing is actually just protecting 
the environment from dumping off into the main part of our colony, because it's still going to cost us just as much to repair or deconstruct and rebuild these insulated tiles. In other news, do you see what we added? That's right. It's another glorious buffer tank. Da da da! We're doing this in preparation for our petroleum rocket. Now, we're always gonna have five tons of petroleum in reserve. We moved some piping around, that way the buffer tank also provided a backup of petroleum for the petroleum generators. We also have another pipe coming out of the output that's gonna be stretching the area all the way back to the rocket engine. Now, we could have saved a little bit in material and had the buffer tank somewhere here. One, this gets a little too hot, but as a reminder, our buffer tanks also have an overheat temperature. So outside of 275 degrees, bad things would start happening. I suppose I could put it in this space here too. And in that way, we could have one buffer tank feeding the engine and the other buffer tank feeding the generators. Ooh, I like that. Let's go ahead and remove all these pipes that we just finished putting in. Looky, looky, who has a new buffer tank? The next buffer tank is in and it's going to be working like a charm. This buffer tank is going to save up the five tons of petroleum, which will also feed into this buffer tank. It's like buffer tank on buffer tank action here on Echo Ridge Gaming. Now it's time to upgrade. I don't remember what happens when you straight up just deconstruct the engine. If it gets rid of all the modules that are on top or not. It goes to show you how very different spaced out and vanilla are when it comes to rocketry. And now that we're no longer going to be using the steam engine, we can get rid of a lot of these gas pipes. And if we're not going to be using that steam anymore, we can turn this steam turbine back on. Although I think we'll save this gas pump because we may end up taking some of the excess carbon dioxide and venting it off to space too. Not sure how that's going to work quite yet. Well, when you destroy the engine, apparently nothing happens. So I suppose we'll just add a petroleum engine back. Okay. Before we do that, we're actually going to deconstruct all these rocket modules. That way, at the minimum, I can get across here and deconstruct this insulated liquid pipe. But also because most of these modules are going to change. We're still going to have some research modules. But now we're going to add a cargo bay that we unlock. We're going to need the solid oxidizer tank. We're going to need the liquid fuel tank. Goodbye to the ESS dumpster rocket. You have served the colony well. In anticipation of bringing home some sweet, sweet rare resources, we're going to go ahead and move this molecular forge. As a reminder, it outputs 16,000 DTUs per second. And instead, we're going to move it to our dumpster brick? I don't know what else to call this. We're also going to be putting the oxalite refinery right next to it. And that means it's time to get a pipe of oxygen in here. And then we're just going to grab the line right off of here because the oxalite refinery does not care how hot that oxygen is. And since we're messing with the oxygen system, we're going to go ahead and open this up to grab this debris. We're also going to remove the gas bridge and everything in here since we'll no longer be using it to provide oxygen for the colony. Eventually, this line is going to go into liquid oxygen production. So it's good to put it down here now anyways because this is probably where our liquid oxygen and our liquid hydrogen systems are going to go. Now we're going to put down our shiny new petroleum engine. But as the usual, I had kind of forgotten that I had opened up the spawn and now it's a disaster. I was debating on coming down here and digging out this abyssalite, but I figured it still works perfectly and it's kind of a shout out to the Royal Society of the Preservation of Abyssalite. I think I've narrowed down once again where the scalding messages might be coming from. The oxygen going into them is pretty hot. The 200 kilos for this Atmos suit is sitting at 66 degrees. While the Atmos suit dock itself is only at 36, I don't know if somehow this is impacting the dupes. And this oxygen is pretty warm. It's all insulated, but this is before it gets cooled down in our water here. So I think we're going to start off by rerouting the oxygen to where it only fills the Atmos suits after the oxygen's been cooled. And because we're going to be pumping a lot more heat through here, I'm turning all of these pipes into radiant liquid pipes. Remember, this polluted water is coming directly from the geyser, so it should keep this tank at around 30 degrees. Allow me to introduce you to our next rocket. And because I didn't want to ruin a good thing, we went with the ESS Dumpster Rocket Mark II. Now, the Dumpster Rocket Mark II has the petroleum engine, two liquid fuel tanks, a solid oxidizer tank, a beautiful cargo bay, and then two research modules. Which means we're not going to be making as many data banks, but two's not too shabby. We had to add another gantry, that way Ed could jump across here and then get into the rocket. And thanks to our two new beautiful buffer tanks, we already have 900 kilos worth of petroleum loaded in each fuel tank. 
Now all we're waiting for is 900 kilos worth of oxalite. But no worries, we're already up over 1600 kilos worth of oxalite. Now we've put in a nice little auto sweeper system for a specific reason. First, we don't want to be manually grabbing 118 degree oxalite, having to carry it all the way up through here, through these two double liquid locks, up here, through two more liquid locks, until we can finally get to the solid oxidizer tank. Chances are they'll drop it a bunch, and just to avoid that, we figured we'd try to automate it. Right now, all that oxalite is going to be dropped off in this conveyor chute here, inside this petroleum liquid lock, which is going to serve kind of two purposes. First, the petroleum's not going to let the oxalite off gas. But second, I'm hopeful that this auto sweeper is going to be able to grab that oxalite and load it into the solid oxidizer tank without dupe intervention. I don't know. I've never tried this before, so we'll see. Now, granted, this auto sweeper is surely going to get damaged a bunch of times. Well, at least until we unlock that beautiful thermium. So to check it out, we're going to go down to consumable ore, select oxalite our wonderful auto sweeper is going to load up the oxalite and along the rail it goes and yes we're still having the scalding messages so that takes away the possibility that it has something to do with the atmosuits or the atmosuit docks i also tried adding temperature shift plates behind each of the steam turbines hoping that that would do something and so far no good all right so far the auto sweeper is not grabbing the oxalite but i think i figured out why the auto sweeper can only see this portion of the solid oxidizer tank. But if we select the solid oxidizer tank and then hit B to go ahead and build another one, you can see that the tile that our cursor is on is right in the middle at the very bottom. So we're going to try to move the auto sweeper down by one so it has access to that specific tile, which also means we need to move this conveyor chute. Hopefully there's enough petroleum in that little tile that it prevents the oxalite from off gassing. All right, here goes our second attempt. Look at that. Works like a charm. So I was starting to look at our range of our new petroleum rocket, and I realized I was probably using the math from spaced out. If we head over to the star map, we can see that we now have a total range of almost 50,000 kilometers, and that our total oxidizable fuel is 1,800 kilos. When I only had 900 kilos worth of oxalite, the range was roughly half this. So with solid oxidizer in vanilla, it looks like the ratio is 1 to 1. 1 kilo of oxalite for every kilo of fuel. But now that we have that range of almost 50,000 kilometers, we can go all the way out here, which will help when we're grabbing all these data modules. But first things first, I think we need to go grab some niobium and isoresin. Let's load up our friend Ed. And of course, because it was time for us to launch a rocket, another meteor shower happened. With the meteor shower finally over, we can retract our gantries. We were literally about to launch Ed. And yet another meteor shower. The game thinks it's funny. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Randy Random isn't in oxygen not included since we have so much time because of the meteor showers i figured i'd do more investigation on the scalding things squish at got out of the suit stood right here and then got scalded and there is nothing over here that that's hot except for these insulated tiles maybe it's the insulated tiles that they're running across question is how do we fix it oh i've got a dumb idea we're gonna run some radiant liquid pipes right through the insulated tile and it would kind of make sense because it's always when they're running across here, and by the time I get to the message, they're somewhere around the steam turbines. The meteor shower is finally over. We can open our bunker doors, clean up the regolith, because apparently the old trick of just blasting off on the regolith doesn't work anymore. The regolith ends up entombing the engine, like so. There's only three tiles here, but you're not able to launch that rocket until those tiles are dug out. Enjoy the new rocket, Ed! Oh yeah. And that petroleum engine's a lot hotter than the steam engine. It's up over 1600 degrees inside of our silo. So we're going to need to make this out of thermium pretty quickly. Because otherwise, I'm going to have to figure out a method to get another gantry in here. Just so the dupes can manually load the oxalite into the storage. I'm really glad I ended up sealing this in. Because that would have fried everything in here. Yeah, some of the temps on the carbon dioxide would have sort of absorbed it. But after a few rocket launches, this would end up being way too hot. Alright, I'm now convinced it's just mini base. Could Wadi got scalded all the way down here? This entire area hovers around 30 degrees because of all the 30 degree polluted water coming up. Confirmed. Mini base is just haunted. If the rocket silo gets that hot just from the petroleum engine, I am really not looking forward to installing the hydrogen engine. Kind of makes me wish there was a small door or an opening here. And that way you could put your rockets truly on the outside. 
To make it even more difficult, you could make all of this out of abyssalite, so you'd have to eventually get over here and destroy it all, put in a nice bunker system, but I think that would greatly enhance the late game... Oh no, the rocket just destroyed the bunker doors. Coming in hot! Why didn't you open Space Scanner? But as I was saying, I think it could greatly enhance the late gameplay with the mini base. It would give you a lot more options too. Of course, then we'd never get to see beautiful things like meteors raining down inside your base or the rocket destroying the bunker doors. Well, I figured out what happened. Apparently this area got so hot, it melted the automation wires. By the way, food for thought, when we sent this rocket up, it actually had more than 1800 kilos worth of oxalite. But when it came back, it has zero. So make sure you only fill it to the exact amount you need, otherwise you're just wasting all the oxalite. The good news though, we have 118 kilos of iso resin and 22 kilos of niobium. In order to get all of our beautiful materials, we're just going to click empty storage, everything falls out, and then we're going to load all of our rare resources in a storage bin right next to the molecular forge. And we now have access to both thermium and insulation. And if you're still theorizing why we're getting the scalding messages, Angry Forest was once again getting scalded standing right here. The difference now being is this insulated tile is sitting at 32 degrees because we started running all the radiant liquid pipes through it. The suits are within temps, the oxygen's within temps, so I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> what else is new, Echo? Well, I hope you've enjoyed another episode here on the Dumpster Fire, where the dumpster's getting so hot, it's literally scalding the dupes. Next episode, I think we're going to start working on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in this area here. Maybe try to figure out something for here, and hopefully, either that episode or the one after it, make it all the way out to the temporal tear. But chances are... I'm biting off more than I can chew by doing all that in one episode. So we'll see. So until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.